Let's now proceed to the question and answer portion. We will entertain some questions from our participants following the mechanics we did last time. We will take those questions that were sent to us online, uh, also from those who will raise their hand. The resource speaker and or the reactor may interpolate. We have a lot of questions so far here sent to us. Uh, may we start with the first? Uh, from somebody who is using the name Sister Marwin Uwane Sar, and the real Sister Marwin was telling us, no, I'm not the one. But anyway, we will take her, her question. Please clarify the relationship between the Forma de Bibir and the present OAR constitutions. And then there is a comment, and I would like to read this. I think uh, Father Emil, there are some inaccurate language you used. Uh, kindly clarify this one also. Father Emil, thank you. Okay. The Forma de Bibir, which was issued in 1589, became the first constitution of the Agustinian Recollection. I said before in 1637, no? The constitution was made, an expansion of the form of Bibir was made in order to meet the needs of the expanding congregation. However, no, the form of Bibir no, did not cease to exist in the present constitution. There are still elements that are still present in our present constitution of constitution of the order. Now remember, in the constitutions of the order, you know, there are three parts. First is the rule of St. Augustine, the present constitution, and the primitive constitution, the form of Bibir. So what are the elements that are still valid in the form of Bibir that are still in the present constitution? First, the importance of recollection, the importance of silence, the importance of peace and tranquility in the community as the sign of the presence of the spirit in the community. So these are some elements in the form of the Bibir that are still present in the present constitution. That's why in the constitution that capsulizes the charism no, does not extinguish the form of the Bibir. It is still alive. Remember, we follow the spirit of the law and the spirit of the law gives life to our charism and, congrega and congregation. So it is not, you might say, inaccurate. It is, um, um, I would rather say, it is not uh, still, uh, it is still, we might say, um, important. No? There is a valid, valid words and in, in, in the spirit of the former Bibir that is still applicable today. That's why, I can, I, I, I can say that the form of Bibir, the spirit of the form of Bibir, the Bibir is still alive in our present constitution because this cannot be extinguished. No? They are more, we might say, important because they are the spirit of the charism of our early Augustinian recollects that are, we might say, no, alive not in the letters, but the way we live as Augustinian recollects. Thank you. Thank you, Father Emil. The spirit of the law transcends time and space, right? What was valid and relevant at that time may also be valid and relevant during our time. Again, another question to you, Father Emil, from uh, Sir Dante Peralta. What is meant by effective and affective poverty in the forma de vivir? So that these are two levels of poverty. Pag sinabi niyo, affective poverty is interior on the, on the religious. Effective is the external manifestation of that poverty in the religious himself and the community. So effective is the interior, effective is the exterior manifestation of poverty, which is simplicity. These are the two words that are encapsulated in the form of the when you talk about poverty in religious life. Effective, interior, effective, exterior manifestation of that poverty, which is simplicity of life. Thank you. Thank you. Integral poverty, both interior and exterior. Thank you, Father. From Sister Soledad Tubay, Sar, why was there a special consideration for those with missions in the Philippines? 
the special consideration is given to the Philippine province at that time of San Nicolas de Tolentino was that first it was far away from Spain. Second, no, the work of the, the apostolates of the friars there was purely missionary. No? However, no, the consideration were made when the first general uh, general chapter of the Agustinian Recollection in 60 was made to consider the fact that the Philippines has a special we might say, situation. That's why the contemplative life was only limited in several houses. Like first in San Juan de Bagumbayan, the first recollect house founded in 1606. Then the monastery of San Nicolas de Tolentino in Intramuros, founded in between 1608 and 1609. Then the house of the uh, founded of the Agustin Recollects in Cavite, Puerto, in 1616. And later, the two houses, San Sebastian in 1621 and Cebu, 1621. These were the only houses limited where the contemplative and convert were lived to the fullest. The rest is missionary. Because you cannot keep, we might say, conventional life in the missions. No, they have you have to spread the word of God, and yet they have the they have the situation that they have to pray on certain times. But the work of missionary apostolate continues. That's why, uh, in order for the recollects not to fall into activism, neglecting its contemplative charism. They are told to observe retreats, go back to these houses. They will be assigned to these houses to observe retreats and rest and reinvigorate, uh, re energize themselves through prayer. And then they will be sent back to the missions. So the Philippines was so special and particular because it is missionary. As I said, only five houses were limited to live that conventional life, which I mentioned a while ago. Thank you. Thank you, Father Emil. The next question I will read still verbatim. The, this can be answered also by Professor Romanilius from uh, Ramon de Leon. Father Emil, you mentioned that the province of San Nicolas de Tolentino saved the order of Augustine Recollects from extinction. May we conclude then that the Philippines is destined to be the evangelizer of Christianity in the world? Okay, yes. In other words, the San Nicolas was born here in the Philippines. And the first provincial curia was in San Juan de Bagumbay, and later it was transferred to Intramuros no? after, the, after 1762, no? after the British invasion. And this was the seat of the province until after World War II. During the Philippine Revolution, it was transferred temporarily to Spain. Then it came back to the Philippines. Then finally, in 1946, after World War II, the seat of the province of San Nicolas was permanently transferred to Madrid, Spain. Now, it is important to note that the Philippine province, the San Nicolas province, saved the recollection from extinction during the liberal persecution of 1835 in Spain. No? And it is right to say that Many of these religious up to the present, you know, that was passed to the present province of San Ezequiel Moreno, that we are still evangelizing like our forefathers, our ancestors, the first recollects who came here in 1606. They are already getting out of the Philippines. You know, many during the time when we were still under the vicariate of the, of the San Nicolas Torrentino Mother Province, we were sending also. Filipino recollects in Spain and in Latin America. And up to the present, the San Ezequiel Moreno province is still sending some recollects no, before the pandemic started no, to Latin America, where they could practice Spanish and meet other recollects who were also non-Filipinos. At present, the present, at present, the province of San Ezequiel Moreno is, uh, is present in these countries, no? uh, Sierra Leone, uh, West Africa, Kaohsiung, Taiwan, no, Saipan, and at present we are in, in, in the Archdiocese of Pontiac, 
Pontianak uh, in uh, in Indonesia. So still we are still evangelizing as our forefathers no, had done before us. Professor Romanilius, do you have uh, something to say? Question, I said the question. You mentioned that the province of San Nicolas de Tolentino saved the order of the Western Recollects from extinction. May we conclude then that the Philippines is destined to be the evangelizer of Christianity in the world? Okay. Did the record no, as San Nicolas no said the, the recollection from extinction? Is the Philippine province is destined to be evangelizer of the world? I, that, is, that was one of the provisions given in 1998 that the Philippine province of San Ezequiel Moreno should have missions besides Taiwan, besides Africa. Another mission in Asia, that was the mandate of the separation of St. Ezequiel Moreno from the mother province of St. Nicholas of Tolentino, that they should have missions specifically here in Asia. So this is just the repetition of the 1621 uh, establishment of the province of St. Nicholas of Tolentino as the only missionary province of the order. There were other provinces there of Aragon, uh, Castilla, Andalusia, but these uh, friars who live in these monasteries were more devoted to community life to prayer, and not one of them. Uh, by the way, from 1606 up to the establishment of Alfaro in, 16, in 1824, the volunteers to the Philippine missions were taken from the prior communities in Spain because St. Nicholas of Tolentino province did not have a formation house. When the formation house uh, of Monteagudo, uh, first in Alfaro, La Rioja, and then in Monteagudo, Navarra, were established, they stopped going around the Comisario Provincial or the Vica Provincial in Spain, stopped collecting or gathering uh volunteers for the philippine missions because they already have their house but still this evangelization work of the recollects continued up to the present time because of the evangelical roots of the evangelization root of saint nicholas of tolentino province thank you thank you father emil and uh, professor manilius Another one here, another question which I find personally interesting in relation to the 500 years of Christianity in the Philippines is from J. Cell Villapaña Nebre. The questions actually are, when did the OAR start accepting Indians, well, either Americans or Asians to become friars? Have we also records on who was the first Filipino OAR was? When did the Filipinos start being sent to missions? Three questions. Okay, answer that, no? Yes, Father Emil. Okay, so because this was a missionary province and many missionaries from Spain are, are coming here, we seldom at least no, um, accept natives, Indios, in the in, in, in our congregation and particularly since we were under the patronato real there were also laws prohibiting the admission of indios 
to this congregation and to the priesthood. No? And this would be mitigated later on in the, six, in the in 1680s. Now, as our records uh, um, um, give us, no, there were at least uh, three, uh, we might say, natives, two from Pampanga and one from Romblon in the 1600s, late 1600s, 1650s, who were accepted as lay brothers. Uh, so they belong to the principalia class. One of the reasons why they were accepted because they belong to the uh, nobility, the native nobility, and they were recommended by these records to allow them to join as lay brothers. Then during the 1820s, now there was problem of uh, supplying the missionaries from Spain to the Philippines. They started accepting Criollos. In other words, these are Spaniards born in the Philippines or mestizos, no? because the parentage is either Spaniard or Filipino. They began accepting in limited, uh, in limited number. And there was one no? from Pandacan, Manila. No, he was assigned in Bohol. Remember, during the Spanish period, the only missions that the recollects had at that time was the Philippines. Until 1898, no? they, during the Philippine Revolution, they expanded their missionary horizons in Latin America or South America. But during this period, limited number of Indios were accepted. Very, very few. Only in the 20th, the, the second half of uh, the second, uh, the early, the later part of the 20th century that we begin to accept Filipinos, Indios, no, in our term, sure, term yeah, no, in the order. We were in, in 1941. Again, no, again, these are two, we might say, two from Romblon and one, I think, from Pampanga. No, and they entered the novitiate in Intramuros. They, they could not be sent to Spain at that time because Spain was suffering from the Spanish Civil War. Of the three, only one was able to persevere. He was Father Arturo, uh, Father Salvador Calzado, who was ordained in 1945. He was the first Filipino ordained, no, recollect priest ordained after World War II. So from 1945 then on, more Filipinos were, uh, would, uh, uh, end, uh, would join the order. And the minor seminary was opened after World War II, and other seminaries were opened, no, in uh, like the, the philosophy in 1965 in Baguio, Iskasi Seminary Recoletos, the, including the novitiate was opened in Kasi in 1970, if my memory serves me right, and the theologate, no, was opened here in Quezon City in 1985 because of the growing vocation of Filipinos entering the, or, the, 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 uh, the order no, in the Philippines. And lately, in 1991, the Snovichet had a separate house in Antipolo. No? It was inaugurated on December 5, 1991. And the top, within the compound of the, pre -no, of the novitiate in Antipolo was the pre novitiate house. No? was open in preparation for the, the, we might say, preparing these candidates before they enter the novitiate, their affective formation, okay? So in other words, the Recoletos were late in accepting Filipinos no? in the order. So the record was the first Filipino Recollect ordained as priest was Father Salvador Calzado. However, in the 1920s, no, there, was, there were also applicants who would like to join the order. They were already diocesan priests, and one of them was from Lipa, from the Diocese of Lipa, who wanted to join no, the order. But we have, it, it was not, uh, it was not, it, it did not push through. He just became, uh, he just continued to be a diocesan priest in, in the diocese at the time of Lipa, Batangas. So that's it. No? That's, this is a very, very few, but now, since we are now a province, no? even before we, beca we became a province, we, are, we have been sending Filipino recollects in Brazil. No? In 1995, we, send, we, opened, and we opened our mission in Sierra Leone. Also, there were also Filipinos. And also, we're sending Filipinos in Panama and other 
parts of Latin America who were volunteers, especially in our mother province, we uh, mission in the Amazon. So we are still um, uh, opening up missions because of the pandemic. We have it, 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 it had to stop because of the dangers of contamination of the virus. But we were already opening more missions, no? especially in Indonesia recently in 2019. Thank you very much, Professor Romanilius. Yes. Is it the Aitas, the Balugas, the Moros? The Filipino now is very difficult to be defined because there's so many, so much blood mixed in his veins. In the past, we have so many recollects who were, let's say, mestizos, criollos, who were accepted. We have Narciso Hernandez in Bohol, born in Pandacan. We had uh, Jose Celis, also born in Santa Cruz. The parents were half, for example, uh, Espanol yung father, Filipina yung mother. So, ano sila? Indio or Mestizo? They were Filipinos and they were accepted in the order. So, who is a Filipino? We, I can say that. Because Father Emil, for example, has Spanish blood. Probably. Um, Chino also. So, Filipino din ako because I have, I think, Spanish blood and Chino also. So, ang, ang, bola no pa. So, uh, I think, when we say Filipino, uh, by the way, when the Spaniard or when the Spanish missionary assigned in the Philippines before returned for vacation to Spain, they were called Filipinos. I remember one time, Valladolid, I heard a conversation. Hey, this a Filipino who came today. So, he was a Spaniard, full-blooded, 100% Espanol, de pura cepa. But he was Filipino in Spain. So that's the problem. Who is a Filipino now? Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor and Father Emil. We proceed to the next question here from Miss Tessie Ponteras of USJR Balamban. I believe that the history of the beginning of the OAR has evolved through the years. I am interested to know how did the provisions in Vita Consecrata of 1996 influence the living and evolving history? Vita Consecrata. I'll answer to that no, question, I'll answer the question. The Vita Consacrata was the apostolic exhortation written by Pope John Paul the Saint, Pope Saint John Paul II in 1996 as a result of the synod of the role of the consecrated life in the church. No? The spirit of the Vita Consacrata no, uh, emanates from the, from the first document issued by Vatican to the Perfecte Caritatis. No? Uh, challenging the religious congregation and religious order to go back to their roots and examine their re-examine their charism. So that is the main document that the Vita has been citing, no? by, written by Pope John Paul II. Now, the main concern of the document is how would the religious respond to the challenges of today which the world is becoming more materialistic, no? atheistic, refusal to acknowledge the presence of God, that would influence the congregation. That's why we have to avoid the idolatries that are contaminating our Christian life. The same thing with the religious life. So that's the first warning. That's why there are four elements in the Vita Consacrata, which is still... Uh, which our present constitution has cited, incorporated in our constitution, like the incarnation of the Word. The Word of God became man. 
But the word of God also should be incarnated in each religious. So that other people, when we, when we, press, when we go to our apostles, they don't see us no? as Father Amy. They would see Christ in us. Second element of the Bita Consacrata, no? the importance of the cross. When you serve, the cross is part of serving like Jesus who had to face the cross. He was born in order to die for us, to save us, and he carried this cross. Therefore, the second element, we have to bear our crosses and face the trials in our apostolate and even in our community life. The third element, which is very important, no? The, the importance of our baptismal promises. Without baptismal promises, we cannot, we cannot, we cannot, we can pronounce our vows because the vows, the religious vows, the evangelical vows are the deepening of our baptismal vows. So we have to renew our vows as Christians based on our baptism. The fourth element, which is very important, the role of the Holy Spirit. No? The giver of all charismatic gifts in the church. That's why the Spirit is very important in our vocation as we grow. No? And the fifth element we have that we should not forget is mission. The purpose of becoming a religious, the purpose of becoming of a priest is not for our own sake, but to respond to the call of Mother Church to serve her when we are called. So these are the five important elements found in Vita Consacrata where the religious had to respond. And these are already incorporated in our present constitution. Thank you. Thank you, Father Emil. I remember also the Vita Consecrata is divided into three parts about the Trinity, Fraternity, and Charity. And more or less, they correspond to our charism, no? contemplative, communitarian, and apostolic aspects. Thank you very much. We proceed to the next question here from uh, Sister Corazon Padua. How many OAR religious are there now? Where are they located? Okay. I'll give that to Professor Manilios if you still remember. Okay. Ako na lang po. Sige. Now, today, because of the revitalization and restructuring of the... Before we had... Since 1998, before 2012... We had eight provinces. Today, we have only four. There was uh, the incorporation of other provinces to the, uh, uh, to the mother provinces where they came from. No? Now, what are these four provinces that exist today? First, in Spain, we have the province of San Nicolas de Tolentino. Second, the province of Santo Tomas de Villanueva. And in one in Colombia, the province of Nuestra Señora de la Candelaria. And in the Philippines, the province of St. Ezekiel Moreno. And because of the declining of the many were leaving the religious life, becoming diocesan priests, others, because of old age, many uh, were, uh, passed away no, to the other life. No? There was a dec decrease of, we might say, uh, religious personnel in the order. Before, the biggest was, I think, I believe, no, the biggest was 1,270. Now, we are more than 900, less than 1,000. Okay, according to, pro, according to the record, give it 980 religious, no? Before the pandemic. Before the pandemic. No? Because of the pandemic, we started dec de decreasing. No, hopeful, for example, one province had only one ordination. No? Only this year. No? So there is a decrease of vocation which the Philippines is also experiencing today. And we have to pray for more vocations. And hopefully, this restructuring and revitalization would move us on no, to greener, we might say, perspectives of how to respond to new book, to the, to the youth who are different from today. No? They are the millennials and Generation X, how they, how they see life different from us today. How do we respond? The pastoral care of the youth. And how do we might say inculcate you know, gospel values in order to discover that they are being called by God to holiness. So these are the challenges that we have today for the care of vocations and 
As of now, there are 980 or less no, recollects throughout the world. No? Where are they found? Of course, they, in, in Europe, they are limited in Great Britain, Spain and, Spain and Italy, Rome particularly. We are in Latin America, Colombia, Chile, Argentina, Peru, no? Panama, no? And, and, and Costa Rica, Guatemala. And in the Philippines, we have, we have today the Philippines, no? uh, Kaohsiung, Taiwan, Sierra Leone, West Africa, as recently Saipan, and of course, most recently, 2019, no? Indonesia. So these are the countries where the recollects are still present today. Thank you, Father Emil. I just remember that tomorrow, September 11, which is your birthday, we will also welcome three brothers to the solemn profession. So yes, uh, that's an addition to the number of solemn professed mm -hmm. in the order. Uh, Professor Romanilius has something to say also? No, I'm just looking at the data here. This book published uh, during the pandemic. Uh, in 2019, indeed, there were 980 total of recollects, 841 priests, 90, 46 brothers, religious brothers, and 93 clerics, meaning profess. This is down from the highest number of recollects in before Vatican II, 1,300 recollects at that time. Uh, after Vatican II, I think the same uh, circumstance or the same condition applied to after Vatican II to many orders like the Jesuits. There were tens of thousands now. After Vatican II, they, were, they decreased remarkably. So other orders suffered also the decrease of vocations. And I think it's proper to reduce the number of provinces among the recollect provinces into four. Because according to one Father General, Prior General, we cannot just devote so much time and so much effort to nationalism. We have to consider the practicality. So many provinces, St. Augustine, St. Santa Rita, with very few personnel. So we might as well uh, combine them or uh, fuse them into four provinces instead of the eight. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Father Emil. Another question from Mr. C2C of USJR Main Campus in Cebu. Having known the history of OAR that shaped the mission in the Philippines by Recollect missionaries, do the Recoletos, especially the province of St. Isikel Moreno in the Philippines, now take into consideration accepting lay Filipino missionaries as collaborators of OAR mission in the Philippines and worldwide? I think I can say it. On the European side, the Spanish side, they have already volunteers, no? European volunteers going to the missions, especially in Africa and Latin America. But here, the present uh, condition of the Philippine uh, province of San Ezequiel Moreno uh, there should be a program for Lake, especially coming from our secular fraternities. Well, even the Four Sword can be joined and the Recollect like Agustinian Youth. So this is under the case of the, uh, one of the secretariats of the province to, to uh, uh, prepare a program where, this, where our OAR lay can collaborate with our missions, not only for fundraising, excuse me. Puro fundraising lang sila, no. They could go there and help our, we might say, missionaries. No, it has to be programmed. The finances should be prepared. It's up to the prior provincial and his council to do that. No? And the secretariat who is assigned no, for the SARF no, and the lay, uh, lay, uh, um, lay members of the Agustinian Recollect family. So, 
up to now, this should be a program to do that. It's up to the higher ups to do that. No? That, that our, our mother province, no? San Nicolas, no, has been doing. They are lay. There were already lay doctors and lay volunteers helping in Africa, in our missions in Sierra Leone, even in, in also in uh, not coming to the Philippines <laughs> uh, during the, handum, the height of the handumanan, we might say, program in Negros uh, Occidental near Bacolod. There are also present these lay collaborators in also in Latin America, especially in Brazil. No. For us Filipinos, what is our response? No, that's up to the prior provincial and and the secretary in charge of our lay members of the Augustinian Recollect family. Thank you. Thank you, Father Emil, and also to Professor Manilius. Um, I don't know if Father Selma, our prior provincial, is around and he can uh, say something on this. But anyway, uh, the 56th general chapter is six months away and probably we can take this as one of the proposals uh, because this question is uh, really a perennial question and we can take this now so that the order probably on the level of the order, they can take uh, some concrete actions to be implemented probably in the next, uh, in the next quadrennium. No? Thank you, Father uh, Sir Chito. We have here another question from Ms. J. Sel Villafania Nebre. A big percentage of parishes that were managed by the OAR are now managed by the dioceses where they belong. For example, Las Piñas, conversion of St. Paul Cathedral, etc. What is the cause of this? Was there just a, a secularization movement in the Philippines? Or there were no enough OAR priests to manage them, so they had to hand them over to the dioceses. Anyone of you? I want Professor to answer that one for, for the first time. <laughs> okay, uh, in the 1920s and 30s, no, we are slowly handing over our parishes. There were no longer missions. Parishes to the diocese and clergy it's not just secular remember no uh the secular tradition controversy ended you know, with the with the end of the spanish regime you know? and because of the que maricinico of pope lay the 13th the blueprint for reorganizing the dioceses and the parishes in the philippines were being implemented after the, provi the uh, provincial council of manila pcm1 that was held in 1907 and in 1910, the creation of no, new dioceses of number one, Tugegarao, Lipa, Calbayog, and Sambuanga, and one prefecture that is in Palawan. No? With the increase uh, of diocese uh, and the elevation of Cebu as an archdiocese in 1934, it's, and the increase of number of, we might say, dioceses, it was high time for the recollects to hand over the former missions which were parishes to the diocese and clergy because we were now focusing our manpower into import, in three important apostolates in the Philippines since uh, the 1920s 30s and the 1940s what are the number one our opening of our new mission in China in Kuwaiti China we need more recollects there no second no the important thing about that uh, uh, the, the, no, is to take care of our prefecture. That was the prefecture of the whole no, island of Palawan and the Calamianes Archipelago with Cuyo and Agotaya and later on Cagayan Sillo. We need more missionaries in the 19, since 1910. It was elevated into a prefecture. And in 1940, after the, after the, op, after the provincial chapter held in Manila, the opening of our new apostolate that is formal education during the American period. So we are no, uh, giving up some of the slowly no, our parishes to the diocese and clergy to focus on, the three, on these three apostolates. It's high time for Filipinos to take care no, of the former missions that we had and that these are, it's high time for the diocesan, Philippine diocesan clergy 
no? to serve their fellow Filipinos. No? There is, there's no secularization controversy during the American period no? because of the needs at the time. Okay, Father Emil, thank you very much. Uh, there are still uh, two more questions here. Uh, Uh, Professor Manil has a comment. Hi, sir. The handing over of parishes in the Philippines to the diocesan clergy, to the bishops, had various motives, various causes, and various situations. First of all, the lack of personnel. The lack of personnel was the main hindrance to accepting more uh, parishes. Another one, the decimation or the massacre of, not really massacre, the killing by, by, one by one of religious missionaries in isolated places by the Moro, we have to accept it no? for what it is, by the Moro pirates a very beautiful and good thesis written on that the Moro invasions of uh, evangelical, uh, meaning uh, apostolic uh, missions in the Philippines has been written and you have to read that uh, or it should be published and it was written by Fray Julius James Tinapao from Bayawan City. Uh, so. The, the killing of religious at one moment in our history, the recollects abandoned Palawan because they were not defended by the government. They had to build their own forts. They had to uh, organize armies, uh, punitive expeditions like uh, Pascual Bermejo or El Padre Capitan Agustin de San Pedro had to build forts in Romblon, in Mindanao, in Banton, an island there, in order to defend, to defend the flux from Moro invasions. So at one moment, they had to abandon this because they were defenseless. You know how many friars were killed by these uh, supposed to be brothers? So many of them. And not only the not only the Moro invasions, but also the the lack of personnel mostly. And by the way, uh, the recollects who went to South America and Central America were recollects who had been uh, trained in the Philippines, the parish life where they were isolated. They were alone, living there in islands, especially in Palawan, where there are thousands of islands, and in Cagayan Silio, in Cuyo, in, in Agutaya, in Culion, in Busuanga, etc. They were, they were abandoned to their own uh, faith, and they were left alone there, and that was not the trend of the order as a whole. So in 1930, there was a trend to return, especially the parishes in Venezuela and Brazil, to return those parishes or missions with only one priest. That is not the purpose of the Augustinian tradition, community life. No, there's only one priest there in the, and so many, so, so many cases of isolated priests. How can you form community life with only one? Please. So they started returning. In the Philippines, the policy was implemented. They returned the parishes in Bohol. They returned the parishes in Romblon, in Mindoro, to the diocese and clergy. And when they felt that there were already enough diocese and clergy to handle the parishes, like in Palawan, thanks to Father Gregorio Espiga, who built the seminary, of course, Father Leandro, Monsignor Leandro Nieto started the seminary and continued by Bishop Espiga. And there were already enough uh, diocesan clergy to handle the, the carriage. 
so they also had to go away from their successful mission, mission accomplished. Oh, that's the solution to all those problems of abandoning parishes. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we will entertain uh, three questions before we close the question and answer portion. We have here, we have here from uh, Mr. Jojit Foronda of USJR Main Campus Cebu. Having heard about uh, restructuring and revitalization of the order, meron bang relevance and continuity in a program, especially for millennial for religious vocation in the OAR? Thank you, Paul. Also, our uh, brothers, the younger brothers, are seminarians, no, do, do, to undergo the process of discernment, no. So we have the ray, no, may gumagabayan, and we have also in the seminaries, no, spiritual director on guiding our, uh, we might say, younger brothers who are preparing to become recollects, no. The program of the prenovitiate was is already there, crafted already, and still being revised, no due to this restructuring and revitalization. So the ongoing process of formation you know, from postulancy to the present is not yet finished. We are still responding to the signs of the times, you know, especially for the millennial and Generation X, because their perspective, their formation in the family you know, are different from us today. That's why we need to craft new programs in order to take care of this vocation. That's why the Secretariat of Formation in the province, in collaboration with the Secretary of Formation of the order, you know, we are still you know, um, crafting uh, programs you know, and translating documents from Spanish to, to English and adapting them to our Filipino culture on this what we call you no know, formation journey. It's a journey. You know? itinerary. The itinerary program is already done, but adapting it to our Filipino culture, you know, it would take time. So this is the way I could say it. You know, we have prog programs, but it has to be in Spanish, European setting, but it has to be adapted to the Filipino setting. Thank you. Thank you, Father Emil. From Sister Corazon Padua, um, I would like to rephrase the question. The Recoletos as an order is now expanding its territories, but there are few OAR religious only, no? Uh, are we not spread too, too thin, thinly? And uh, how does the OAR manage this? The, the question is uh, to that effect. Uh, the expansion of the order depends upon the availability of personnel. No? We, don't, we don't just accept if there are no personnel, no? available or the assignment uh, the assigning other religious in order to you know to help other women to, when we pull out another somebody has to replace him so it would take time you no know? it would take time that's why whenever we are accepting any mission we have to see to it that number one sustainability now, can we sustain the mission with three religious the minimum is three to four religious in a community can we do that uh, before accepting the invitation to accept a parish or a mission so that's the thing that we have to there are several considerations have to be made before accepting a mission or, or expanding it's easy to expand but can we sustain the expansion with the number of personnel personnel available so that's it, no? It needs uh, discernment and it needs uh, we must reassigning religious in order when a religion is taken out to be assigned somewhere else. So these are uh, on the part of the provincial, the secretary of mission, have to be consult. They have to consult the other communities in order to get available personnel for our future no, missions or future assignments. 
that's the answer that I could give for now. Thank you, Father Emil. There is also an element of inter-provincial collaboration no, in the order. Thank you. Uh, probably the last here from uh, Ramon Villion. What is the role of the tertiaries, referring to the SARF, in the mission of the OAR? Okay, for now, the SARF, the Secular Agustin Recollect Fraternities, no, there's, it's, a bigger, it's getting a bigger number and the membership, no? Um, it has to be reoriented to the mission works of the order, not just for fundraising, not just for prayers. No? The national president of the SARF, the national president, is, was asking, what can we do, no, mo what more can we do to help the province and the order? No? It's not just for no, selling tickets, for fundraising, no? uh, collecting, we might say, funds in order to support a vocation. We can do more than that. So they have been asking the higher-ups. No? Ano bang magagawa namin more than fundraising and prayers? Because many of us are engineers, we are, are lawyers, ex-professionals. What can we do more for the province? And uh, the, one could, the one who could answer that are the higher-ups. I cannot answer for these people. I'm just one of the spirit director of the local fraternity here. I'm just giving formation inputs. But their contribution to the order, to the province in particular, depend upon the higher-ups. That's my answer for now. Okay, thank you, Father Emil. I don't know if Professor Romanilius has something to say in relation to this topic. Before we close the question and answer portion. The lay collaboration. Meaning the collaboration of the laity with the evangelization task of the recollects has always been there since time immemorial. We have Isabel de Butuan, we have the Talangpa sisters who became the congregation of the Gusian recollects sisters, and we have many, many more in the Philippines. And I think Kakali Kalimdim. Oh, was that? Clara Kaliman. Clara Kaliman. So they were there not only to, to help the priest in the catechetical wars, not only to help the parish priest in uh, pinpointing the problems or the problematic members of the community. There are many ways to help the order, not only as a Padre said, through prayers, which of course are very important, the prayers of the laity uh, for the priest, and the good example given by these uh, lay collaborators, who now I think can be found also in the Cofradias, uh, founded in Baguio, for example, the Cofradia de la Virgen del Carmen in Cebu, Cofradia de la Virgen del Pilar in Cebu, Cofradia de la Virgen del Carmen, recently in Manila, they also to trying to revive the Cofradia de la Virgen del Carmen. And these Cofradias are also lay collaborators, no? And they also show the good example to the others. And, and it is the job of the Recollects to support, to inspire, to train them, to teach them uh, the values needed for the Christian application the application of the Christian tenets or beliefs. I think that's one big uh, collaboration, collaborat collaborative act of the laity with the work of the Augustinian Recollects in the Philippines and in the world. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Father Emil. The, the expression shared mission with the laity actually is invoked now, not only in our documents, but even also in the Vatican uh, documents. So. Uh, communion, synodality, these are the terms that point to that. So we are very much sorry if you cannot entertain more questions by raising your hand, for example, but uh, we welcome if you still have more, you can send them. Anyway, we still have uh, two lectures remaining, so reserve them probably for the next time. 
We thank our resource speaker, Father Emilio Quilatan, and our reactor, Professor Romanilios, for sharing their time and expertise uh, so that uh, we will be able to deepen also our knowledge and appreciation about our Recoletos uh, identity, history, and spirituality.